Father God, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for this day. Not a day of Hallmark cards, though there will probably be many open. Not a day of chocolate and gift cards, though many of those will be given. God, this is the day the Lord has made, so we rejoice and we're glad in it. You are on the throne today, and so we say thank you. But we do pause and reflect on the gifts that you've given us of mothers and of women who have served the role of mothers in our lives, aunts, Sunday school teachers, classroom teachers, so many people, neighbors, that just pour into the lives of us and our children, and we just say thank you. Thank you for giving us the gift of these women. God, I pray that we would be able to stir them on to know that they are valued and loved and to help lighten the load <laughs> when we can. But God, there is so much that you created for just women to do, that there's a uniqueness that they offer to the marriage, to the family, to the church, to the community. So God, I ask that you allow them to do those things with your power. And God, allow for us as a community to realize the benefits of having everyone here, various backgrounds, married, single, men, women, various ethnicities and cultures. God, we are stronger because of these unique differences. So today, God, I say thank you for making women. You took a rib from Adam and you created a companion, a helper, like the Holy Spirit is referred to as a helper, uh, to complete, to bring completion and to come alongside. And so, God, we just say thank you for what you've created. Help us not to abuse, or to stand over, or to roll over your creation. God, we just say thank you. So today, God, I ask that you speak through your word, that you would speak through your servant, that your glory would be present here. Holy Spirit, use your words and the songs that we sing and the meditations of our heart, God, to Stir us up to know more about who you are and who you've created us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. There are a couple seats in the front if anybody needs them. Um, but thanks for being here today. Whether in person or online or on the phone. Charlene, we love you. Wish you were here. Um, there are there's joy when we see people, and um, it's just great to be together. There are a lot of things you could be doing today, a lot of stores you could be running to to get that gift you forgot to buy, uh, <laughs> whatever it might be that's on your agenda, you could be doing that, but no, you said, I'm going to take time and come and worship the Lord, and the Lord notices, and he says, thank you. He's worthy of it, but he appreciates that we give him of ourselves our time, our efforts, our energy. So thank you for being here. We are in this series called In the Waiting. We'll take a break from it next week when Pastor Taylor preaches. Be praying for him. The Lord will speak through him with a passage that the Lord's put on his heart, and he needs your prayer. As men of God, as speakers of his word, there's a lot of spiritual attacks. Even this last week, Tuesday and Wednesday, I was dizzy and nauseous. <laughs> But the Lord revived my strength and allowed me to have time to study to bring you a message today. Now, is that just low blood sugar? Is it stress? Is it a spiritual attack? I don't know, but I'm telling you, the devil doesn't like when God's name is lifted highly correctly. When we preach the word of God as it should be, there's a spiritual battle going on. So Lord willing, Taylor Zay next week will preach a message that's from the Lord, which means that he's going to be attacked by the evil one, right? And so we need to pray as his protection on him for direction on him. And then we'll step back into 2 Thessalonians the following week. But in this week, I do want to reference Mother's Day, and my wife has this mug at home. OMG, my mother was right about everything. <laughs> and uh, oh my goodness, this can be a way you can reference those to be in a pastor's home, but uh, my mother was right about everything. And I'm not sure if her mother gave that to her, she bought it from Target. <laughs> She said she bought it, so 
Um, but it's interesting that as we become parents and start becoming moms and dads, we observe the world a lot differently to see what our moms and dads had to go through and the things they said were going to happen, happen. And you don't have to have children to make this mug be true for you. Your mom might have told you to study for that test or you're going to fail and you didn't study and then you failed and you're like, oh man, my mom was right. <laughs> and there can be this eye-opening experience as children. We don't want to always admit it, but there are some times when life just shows us mom did know best. <laughs> now the possibility is, is that you didn't have a mother who knew best or who was right about anything. Maybe they weren't even involved in your life in any way. So let me broaden this illustration to just say there are a lot of people that are willing to give you their opinion, to give you some advice. We are just overwhelmed with information, and it's bound that one of those pieces of information is going to be right. And there can be a lot of people trying to give us some suggestions and some counsel. And a lot of the counsel in our lives, we have to then say, is this wise counsel or is this just a bunch of noise? And my mother's counsel is not wise because she's my mother. It's wise because of the content and the heart by which it is given, right? It's, it's not every teacher gives you wise counsel. No, the teacher's place is not what makes their counsel wise. It's the message that they give you and the heart of which they give it to you. A position does not mandate wisdom. <laughs> but God is the source of all wisdom. So God's position, who God is, is where all wisdom originates and flows. But if I'm honest, in our world today with smartphones and um, voices that are listening in my house, the Alexas of the world. There's just a lot of things available to me and to you. We have to decide which of this can go in the garbage and which of this needs to be put into a place of safekeeping. What of the counsel that we're receiving is worth remembering as being wise? Well, today we're going to look at wise counsel as paul writes at the end of this passage this letter to the thessalonians living in thessalonica the first of two letters written after timothy comes back from a missionary journey with the report of the church in thessalonica and paul writes them a letter encouraging them shaping them in certain areas we've talked about various things over the last couple weeks but today i want us to ask this question of who <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. How should we respond to wise counsel? So the first thing, as I've already pictured or that we have already laid out that we need to do first is say, what is wise counsel? We need to filter the counsel as being wise or not wise. And now our job is how to respond to that counsel. So let me, I can't take forever to give a sermon on is this wise counsel or not. The answer to that biblically is does it align with God's word? So wise counsel, is it what God says? God is the source of all wisdom, so if there's somebody telling you to do something, does that align with what I read in the Bible? That's how you say, is it wise counsel? So that sermon can be summed up with, read your Bible. Now, what do we do with the wise counsel? That's what we're going to see here today in this letter to the Thessalonians. Because responding to wise counsel is something that we have to think about, we have to be intentional about, that we have to participate in. So I'm going to read this passage over us, the entire 12 to 28, the last parts of this letter, and let God preach, and then we'll apply it to our lives. So the word of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 28, read, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances 
For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under an oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, I want us to look in this passage at how we should respond, and there are three things that I want us to notice. The first thing is that we should see that we need to respond to wise counsel by living upwardly. I'm using this terminology, not, not that I need to elevate where I'm living and go and live in the mountains, but we need to live with a vertical mindset, with an upward motivation, <laughs> with our eyes fixed on the Lord, on the heaven maker of heaven and earth. We need to live upwardly. I'm going to go through this passage a little bit and talk about some of these ideas here that demonstrate the people in Thessalonica living upwardly, living towards a high standard, becoming more like Christ. He says, we ask you brothers, which if you look in the Greek, and some of your Bibles actually have done this, some of you don't like that they've changed this, but it does reference not a gender thing, but a group of believers, brethren, uh, believers, brothers and sisters, some of your Bibles have added that. This is not just to the men of the church. This is to the believers, Paul's brethren, his brothers, his family. And we see here, we're supposed to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And through many of the commentaries, they would hold here that this is referencing the leadership of the church. Now this was written about a month after Paul had been in Thessalonica. But because of how the Jewish culture understood the temple, they probably would have established when they built the church some leadership structure. A church would not have had no leadership. That's not what they would have understood a church to be. And so there were some leaders that were raised by the Lord and affirmed by the people in their church. Now some of your versions, I think the NASB uses... Uh, diligently working, this laboring among you, which is something we need to understand. It's, there is a lot of work being done by these people. It's not people that have a position and an office and power. No, there's, there's toiling. There is a lot of labor being done. They are weary by the job. Not working over them, notice. Working among them. <laughs> How many church leaders today have what maybe we would call a celebrity status. A little bit more like LeBron James walking down the courtyard and goes to a restaurant. I guarantee you, he's not paying that bill. Wait, you're here? Let me take care of that for you. There's a lot of pastors who experience that type of response because they are superstars. But God's idea of a leader, as we see here, is one who is working hard and among the people not above them, not over them, not, in this sense, too good for them. No, he is with them and working hard. Notice, they are over them in the Lord, not over them in themselves. They're over them by the uh, will of the Lord, but also in the way of the Lord, right? That we are called as husbands to be leaders of our home, but how? As Christ loved the church, and how did he do that? By sacrificing himself for her, right? There's leadership, and the Bible is not one of slave master. No, we are called as leaders of the church, as pastors of the church, to be over you in the Lord and to admonish you. This is a word of care with correction. <laughs> to admonish you is to redirect but in love. Shame on me if I'm here 
tickling your ears, always telling you what you want to hear. You're so glad you came today because they're just told you're doing everything perfectly. That's not being admonished. Admonishing is calling good, good, and calling us from good to better. That's what our leaders need to do. That's what our elders and our pastors and our Sunday school teachers, these people need to meet us where we are and get us to where God wants us to be. <laughs> Admonish you. Notice Paul says of these people to respect them. In the NASB, I think it says to know them. It's to be aware of their position and come alongside them with your life, with your respect, with just, I'm, I'm in support of you. And I have to tell you, church, you've done a great job of doing that for me. So thank you. <laughs> um, I feel loved. I feel respected. <laughs> I feel cared for. And Lord willing, I'm doing my part, laboring among you, <laughs> serving in the power of the Lord, not power of my flesh, and admonishing you. That you hear words of care with sometimes correction. Because we all have room to grow. We all have not finished the race. But Paul goes on. He says of these people to esteem them very highly in love. Notice because of their work. Church is too often in our culture that we esteem people because of their position. It's too often we, we esteem people because of their name, because of their family. Oh, oh, he's a Kennedy, right? Or um, that person has gone to a certain school, and that's why they're worthy of our respect. No, he says here, because of their work. So I need you to assess me. As elders, we need you to, to keep an awareness of, are we doing what we're supposed to do? And if so, then there can be an esteeming and love, but it's not something that's a guarantee because of a position. The Lord is worthy of praise, only the Lord. This is not words of praise, but it's viewing people with um, permission to speak in our lives. <laughs> it's, it's viewing people in a position that they can ask the hard questions. I give you permission. You're, you're in that position in my life that I can let you be something that other people can't be. That's the esteeming here. It's still people level. It's not God. We're not worshiping them, but we are esteeming them by lifting them up to have influence in our life. And notice he says, highly in love, to love them deeply. <laughs> and again, I come to you today to affirm that you are doing this. I feel it. Thank you. <laughs> Keep it up. We as a church are not perfect, but I think we are healthy. I think we are God-honoring. And this is an element of that. So thank you for esteeming and loving me and our elder board. We feel very much supported. And it's easy to lead a group of people that want to be led and that ask you to lead them. It's an honor to do that for you today. Paul finishes that verse by saying, be at peace amongst yourselves. <laughs> um, this is spoken as if Paul, there must have been problems in the church that he's like, hey, figure it out. Be at peace. <laughs> Maybe there was an argument over who was supposed to be a leader. Maybe there's an argument of who, who was supposed to be an elder or who was supposed to be the pastor. There might have been some dissension. Or, why wasn't I chosen to be a leader? There might be some dissension. And Paul says, be at peace amongst yourself. There are seasons that we go through. God calls certain people to leadership at certain times for a certain amount of time. And then they stop. And somebody else comes in. And then they lead. And this happened when Pastor Tony retired. He was a great leader. He, he led this church through so much and brought so much healing. And I am, owe so much to that man for his mentorship and his leading of our church. And me as his brother in Christ. 
But God said that his time had finished and he went to California to be with his family and he's so much ministry to do there and God asked me to be here. And there are seasons when people come and go, but in the midst of all this, there can be a lot of turmoil. You want to find a church that's not peaceful? It's probably one that's doing a pastoral search. Or one who does not esteem or love their leadership. So I'm not sure what was going on in Thessalonica, but there must have been something that Paul says, hey, do this because it's God's will for you. Be at peace. He goes on, we urge you, brothers, <laughs> and there's a list here, and we should probably all do some of these things at some time in our life, but different seasons, we might do some more than others. He says, first, Admonish the idol. This is the admonish word, again, like we saw from the leadership. So not just leaders are called to admonish. No, everybody is called to admonish. Caring correction. <laughs> With love, lift people to where they can be. Who? The idol. Those that are giving up. They've sat down in the middle of the race and they're just not doing anything. Correct them. With love. Restart them. In the walk of faith. Let me just pause and say, if you're idle today, God says that's okay. But don't stay there. There can be seasons of rest. But not our permanent home. So if there are any of us that are idle, that are just weary and just not ready to keep moving, we just need to lovingly encourage them, admonish them. And then it says, on, encourage the faint-hearted. <laughs> if any of us are faint of heart, if we are just struggling to hold on to the faith, Paul says, to encourage them. Put courage into them. <laughs> Is that your call today? Maybe you're faint of heart and you need to be encouraged. Going on, he says, help the weak. <laughs> In the Greek, this is a... The picture is one of a weak branch being strengthened by, like, wooden poles. And if you ever have gardening, like a tomato plant or something, you might have just an element that this is just really weak, and so we strengthen it. We surround it with things that give it support. So we need to help the weak. It's not do it for them. It's come alongside them and teach them to become stable. Now, something in gardening with this idea, Lord willing, that plant won't need the support forever. Lord willing, that plant will begin to grow and be strong, and while it's being helped by this thing, it can build an inner strength so that the supports can go and help some other plant. <laughs> the support is not there for a lifetime. We help the weak so they can become strong, not so they can stay weak. This is not enablement not entitlement. <laughs> this is not um, a welfare system that we just stay in. No, we come along and we add strength so that they can strengthen through the Lord. And then finally, he says, be patient <laughs> with who? Them all. <laughs> who today would you say that God has put on your heart that it is most difficult to be patient with? Mothers in the room, it might be your children. Or it might be your knucklehead husband. <laughs> there are people that the Lord has put in our lives that it's just, it's hard to be patient around them. I, I have a long wick. If you think about like a, a bomb and the, you light it down here and, you know, the, it's coming, you know, before it blows up. And I have a long time of, I can put up with a lot with a lot of people. But I get home and all of a sudden it just gets shorter, right? Like this is the place where I just need to relax and the people that used to say things to me that I just like, oh, that's okay. Now my dog comes up and wants me to pet him and I'm just like, get out of here. Yeah. Anybody else can attest to this? I'm not perfect. Right, we come home and it seems like the patience just kind of has been used up. And the people at home, the people we love the most, get our leftovers of patience. To that I say, we're sorry. <laughs> we need to do better. 
Paul says, be patient with everyone. We need the Lord's strength. We need the Lord's help to be patient when we normally wouldn't want to be. And you might think you have the strength to be patient with people at work, to put up with that thing early in the morning, but in the hours when you are at your weakest are the times when you need the patience the most. And God says, I am strong in your weakness. Christians, we can be patient with everyone if we do it in the Lord's strength. In our own, we will fail we will fall short of this upward call. Verse 15, there's so much here, I won't take too long on the next points, but see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another. Oh, by the way, and to everyone. (laughs) This is a hard one for us in our day and age today. It says, don't return evil for evil. This Paul's not saying that the original evil is something that we are avoiding. No, we're avoiding a response of evil. When evil comes against you, don't respond with evil. It says, don't repay evil for evil, but instead seek to do good. And the context here, it's not seeking to do good to those that have been good to you. That's going to come naturally. What's the context here? It's repaying evil for evil. So instead of repaying evil, do good. Why? It's because of people that did evil to you. It's doing good to those that don't deserve you doing good to them. It's the Christian way. Turn the other cheek. Man, ask for your coat. Give them your tunic as well. It's, it's going above and beyond, right? It's giving somebody something that they don't deserve because we have been given so much that we don't deserve. So instead, seek to do good to one another and to everyone. What does it mean to do good to people? Does it mean to make them happy? It doesn't mean to make their needs go away. It's to think about what does God want this person to receive and be willing to do what I have to to give them that. Now, there could be some people that to do good by them would be to go and watch their kids so that they can go on a date. That could be good for them. (laughs) There could be some people, though, who need to spend time with their kids. So you say no to that babysitting thing might actually be good for them because they need to be parents because they're just dating too much, right? There there could be an extreme on both things. So one answer is not good for all people. We need the Lord to direct us to say what is good In this situation, how can I pursue that for this person? To do good for everyone is not a cookie cutter, follow these rules and you'll be fine. No, it's God, guide me, lead me. I need your help. What should I do here for the betterment of the people and for the glory of the Lord? We need to seek his counsel. Verse 16 short verse, maybe the second shortest in the Bible, Jesus wept, so number one. Here it is. Rejoice always. <laughs> and again, I say rejoice, but Paul just had to say it once. Now, this is important in the context of the verses. We're not doing good to those that are evil to us, but grudgingly. We're not, God told me I have to be good to you. No, he said, rejoice always. Like, as you're doing this, keep rejoicing. <laughs> Do it in the overflow of your heart. And church, sometimes it's hard for us to rejoice because we forget why we should be rejoicing. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. So if you need to have a reminder of why we should rejoice, remember that the sun rose this morning. Remind yourself that you just took a breath. Rejoice. And the heart of which we respond to the evil of our world will change when we have a heart that is rejoicing. You want to not be mad at somebody? Pray for them over the next few days and see how your heart will change. Notice I said pray for them, not pray against them. But if you're praying for somebody, you're just, your heart is going to change about that person. So when somebody is evil against you, to, before you do good, maybe we need to reference verse 16, rejoice. And watch the goodness overflow in response to that. 
Verse 17, pray without ceasing. This is one that I reference a lot, and I use it to redefine for me what prayer means. Because I don't know about you, but my government, my boss, well, I'm, I guess I'm the le- my own boss here. It's kind of unique. But um, in the past, when I had a boss, I couldn't just stay home and pray, and everything would be fine. Like, uh, I'm calling off work today. i got to pray. Uh, I'm not showing up to the court that I was supposed to come to for jury duty. I've got to stay home and pray. Like, this is not well received. Okay, uh, did you go get groceries? No, I, I had to stay home and pray. No, it's not close your eyes, fold your hands, 24 hours a day, 365 and a quarter. It's not, it's not do that all the time. No, it has to be redefined what it means to pray. I sleep, do you? How do we pray while we sleep? We have to redefine what prayer means. To live in prayer is to live in a posture that's aware of who God is and who I am correctly. Prayer. So I can pray as I'm making food. Because I'm thinking about the food that God's given me. And what a blessing that he's given me this family I'm cooking for. And I can think of things through a godly lens. That's prayer. I can do that without ceasing. (laughs) We have to redefine what it means to pray. It's to be in communion with God, to be in fellowship with Him. We have Him within us. We as Christians can be with God all the time. He's right there. We are His temple. (laughs) Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Remember those evil for evil ones? Yeah, give thanks for those too. (laughs) All circumstances. The will of God is this in Christ Jesus. And he says, do not quench the Spirit. This is something that I think is important. I've used this in some men's Bible studies before too. Christians, because we've been raised from the dead with Jesus' blood and resurrection, because we have victory over death and sin, we've been given the Holy Spirit, the first fruits of what's to come, right? And just because we have the Spirit doesn't mean that we live by the Spirit. Just because Solomon was given all the wisdom doesn't mean he used the wisdom, amen? I mean, he made a lot of mistakes after he was given godly wisdom. (laughs) But as Christians, we can, based on what Paul says here, we can quench the Spirit. The picture I've used is that the Spirit lives in your house, but we have have him going from the master bedroom to any room you want to... Why don't you go to the basement, and uh, what, why don't you move into that little closet over there? I, I need some more space for my other stuff, and we just minimize where the Spirit can be in our life, and He's still there, but He's not really loud or influential, and we can quench the Spirit. Do we lose the Spirit? No. But do we lose awareness of the Spirit? I think we can if that's you today, if, if you feel like the Spirit, I, I've been saved, I know the Lord, and the Spirit's just not active in my life, then I would say, then open some doors. <laughs> let, let the Spirit move around in your whole body that He can have anything He wants. God, all I have is yours. And watch the Spirit start to grow. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit will come when it has room to grow. Test everything not despising prophecies, verse 20. There were probably some people that were saying things that were from the Lord, and they were just like, I'm not going to hear that. He says, well, hold on, test it. Don't just despise it because it's a prophecy, because it's a message from the Lord. Maybe it is from the Lord. So test it, test everything. Hold fast to what is good. And lastly, abstain from every form of evil. Church, I don't know about you, um, <laughs> for those of us that don't know the will of the Lord, I would just give in a really long list. It's going to take me a lifetime to accomplish. <laughs> but the Christian life is not box checking. It's relationship, right? Relationship with God, and it's going to have certain elements, but we are striving towards living upwardly to be these kinds of people. Where we'd say, Man, yeah, God, through your strength, I have been able to do that. I, I have been able to live that way. This is the upward living we're called to live. As a child, I grew up playing basketball. My father is six foot eight, so you can connect the dots if you want. It's a natural thing to, to learn. 
my dad played in college, and um, I just I loved the game. Uh, from a very young age, I dribbled, I shot, I played all the time. And when I was in elementary school, middle school, um, the local area had a free throw contest. And two out of the three times, I won for the, the district or whatever and got to go to regionals for the free throw shooting contest. And it's because of a lot of practice, a lot of coaching from my father, um, that I was able to be accomplishing the one, re- the one district level and get to regionals. And when we got to regionals, it was at the local state college. And it was not too much different than this picture here where the lights were on, but, you know, the, the idea is that it was, it was massive. There were seats all over the place. I never was shot in a gym so big. But when I came up to the, to the game, to the competition, there were a lot of people who equally had practiced. They, they'd won their district too, and so it was the best of the best. We were getting more... Um, you, you couldn't miss as many shots, right? I mean, there were... Before, if you shot 80%, you might have won, but now you've got to shoot 90 and there's an expectation that as you get around better people, you had to increase your percentages. Similarly, church, this uh, idea of these lists of things can be like a, sh- a hundred shots of free throws. And I'm going to tell you, I desired to make every one. But I never did. <laughs> never did. I never made every shot. <laughs> I'm, I missed a couple. Do you know Michael Jordan, arguably the best basketball player in the world? Young people, if you want to say LeBron James, I don't care. Nobody has ever made every single shot. But we strive to, right? We, we aim to be perfect. We aim to make every shot. And in this analogy, in this illustration, I came to the line and I shot. And if I missed it, If I personally got discouraged at the miss, I missed the next three. But if I just said, you know what, I'm going to make the next one, (laughs) I made it a lot more often because of how I responded to a miss. And what what separates a lot of the people in sports or other areas of life is not how they respond to victories, but how they respond to defeat. Now, we are living upwardly. We are aiming our lives to be righteous before the Lord But it's the times that we stumble that often shape us the most. It's the times when we don't live at peace with everyone and we respond and we see that that's not what God wants and we do better. And so from this perspective, my illustration from this, and you can write it in your notes if you want to, is just make the next one. (laughs) Just make the next one. If God's calling you to respond to some evil, just respond to that one. Don't be overwhelmed by the task of the rest of your life. Don't be overwhelmed by the past of what you have or haven't done. Just just make the next one. Just do your best to make the next one. That's what it means to live upwardly. Not to live perfectly, but to live in pursuit of perfection. And loved in the misses. (laughs) Loved in the mistakes. Secondly, we see, and these next points will not go as long, but uh, we see that we need to live from within. We need to be living from within. And I don't mean this in some new age, find your inner self. No. Remember who's in the believer, the Holy Spirit, God himself indwells us. Notice God's um, part in this. Notice what God has to do in some of these verses that we see in verses 23 And 24 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. Let me pause again and say, it's not may you be sanctified, it's may God sanctify you (laughs) completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless. Not be blameless, no, be kept blameless. At the coming of our Lord Jesus, he who calls you is faithful He will surely do it. God is the one that is doing these things in these passages. God has a part to play, and we are better for it. (laughs) Praise God for being the one who is the one who's going to sanctify us. The peace, God of peace, he's going to sanctify you completely. Remember, sanctification is holiness. It's being set apart for a purpose. God is going to do this. He's going to make us different. 
The old is gone. The new has come. We have a spirit in us causing us to respond differently. From within, we are living by God's direction. Notice we are kept blameless, that we may be kept blameless um, at the coming of our Lord Jesus, that our whole body, spirit, soul, body would be kept blameless. It's not that we live sinless lives now, but we are kept under the blood of Christ, which because of the death of Jesus, we are blameless. (laughs) God, keep the penalty of sin covered in the blood. Amen? Amen? We, we want him, God, do what you promised you would do. You said that Jesus' death would be enough. Let it be enough. Let us stay as beloved children, blameless. And then notice verse 24, Paul says, Plainly, he who called you, remember, because you didn't call yourself into salvation, the Spirit of God moved in you to pursue him. He who called you, is faithful. (laughs) The promises of the Bible are not good if there's not a promise keeper. For Jesus to say, I will never leave you or forsake you, is empty if he can't fulfill that promise. The promise of if God is for you, then who can be against you is empty if God doesn't fulfill that promise. We need God to be a faithful God, a God who keeps his promises. So he will do it. He called you. He will set you apart. He will keep you blameless. This is God's heart. I mentioned this earlier when the kids left to Children's Church. And if you've been left at school or left at a ball game and not picked up, I'm sorry. It probably scarred you. You don't trust your parents the same way that you used to. And mothers, if I'm giving you something at lunch to say sorry for, then follow the Lord's leading, okay? This is a day that we honor you, but you're not perfect. But for a child to enter school being dropped off by their parent, and not worry about whether they'll be there allows them to live fully while at school. I can interact with my friends. I can learn what I need to in my classroom because I'm not worried about what happens at 3.05 or whatever time your school gets out. The fact that God is going to do what he's calling us to do and he's going to do what he promises to do for us allows us to live in the moment as we should. If a child has parent who says they're going to pick them up, and then they don't, now they're distracted from learning. They're distracted from fellowship because they're just worried about what's going to happen after school. And so if we find ourselves worried in the midst of the living, the pursuit is not worry less. It's grow our confidence in God's faithfulness. Because when we trust God more, the worry will decrease. Where are you at today? Do you trust that God will do his part? The wise counsel response would be to trust him. He is faithful. Finally, our last element is to live outwardly. We respond to wise counsel by living outwardly. The last verses here say, brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under an oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. (laughs) The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Notice, I love how Paul asks them to pray for them. (laughs) Hey, we need you. It's not just all that we can give to you. Remember, you can pray for us. But these people have to get beyond their own personal prayer list to be adding other people to the prayer list, right? It's thinking outwardly. And then, remember, greet all the brothers and sisters. Some of your Bibles have that noted there. It's both. It's this, all the family of God with the holy kiss. It's not just you and your relationship with Jesus. 
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, is a great truth. But we can't hold on to this little token of being loved by God and not live in fellowship with the community around us. We have to live outwardly, thinking about the people that God has brought into our lives. And then in 27 he says, an oath before the Lord. It's a, a strong way of saying it to say, hey, read this to everybody. Don't, don't make this just be read among the elite. Don't, don't exclude anybody from hearing these words. I need everybody in your church fellowship, men, women, Gentile, Jew, slave, master. Remember Paul says there is none of that in the church. No, let everybody hear these words living outwardly. <laughs> Some of us disqualify ourselves or allow society to disqualify us from being worthy to hear God's words. And God says, no. <laughs> That's not true. This is for you. Share this with them all. And it concludes, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The grace of our King Jesus, the Messiah, chosen one, it's not first name Lord, middle name Jesus, last name Christ, right? It's title, King, Lord, Jesus, the one who says God is mighty to save. Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one, the one that was promised from long ago, the faithful God who sent his only son. His grace be with you. It's my prayer for us today that his grace, his gifts would be over you. A community like this, living like this, is really a gift. It is a chance for us to live uniquely. Sadly, this is what a lot of America looks like today. Um, some of you, I'm just asking you, I'm guessing for Mother's Day lunch, your mothers would love to have no phones at the table and not have to tell you about it. <laughs> but so often, it's me and what I'm going through and I'm in community, but I'm really not. The next picture shows a family that's just fellowshipping together, having a great time, just spending time together, playing games. And so the next picture shows uh, just a family that's more outwardly focused. It's not just me and my life, as the world would want to say. It's not the iPod, right? Because the iPhone is all about you. You're the most important thing in the world. It's all about you. No, it's all about God. And we are called to think about others. More important than ourselves, the Bible says. <laughs> wow. Countercultural? Yes. Possible in the Lord? Yes. You know what that means? We'll be different. We'll be set apart. We'll be holy. We'll be sanctified. <laughs> because as Christians, we do care about the people around us. Not a shame on any of us if our head is over or just our own studies and our own life and our own problems. That I get it. But know that God cares for you and you can think of other people because your burdens are not your own to bear. Again, our problems are solved by increasing our awareness of God, not decreasing the realities of our problems. This sounds like um, what a mother would want their children to strive to be. <laughs> this sounds like motherly counsel, wise counsel. Not that we'll be perfect, but we'll be loved in the journey. And that we can do so much more because of the spirit that lives within us. So may we strive to do likewise in the love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to come before your throne and just say, God, you are worthy of praise. God, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us your spirit. Thank you for giving us your people to live in community with, God. Help us. It's easy to live life but it's hard to live the life you've called us to live. It's easy to just go through the motions and put in our
clock in and clock out and go through the day and go to sleep and just do it all tomorrow. But God, you make each day unique. You make each day purposeful. We are here today for a reason. So God, help us to find out why and to remember through your spirit that we can respond differently. So God, help us. Teach us. We say thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will be available on the